New Testament scholar Craig Keener has a two-volume, 1,200-page work called Miracles. And in the first book, he talks about all the miracles in the Bible. And in the second book, he talks about miracles that have happened in the last 100 years. And he gives documented stories of people who were healed from terminal sickness, who recovered in response to prayers from the people. And he even tells a story of people being raised from the dead. Miracles can happen today. Miracles do happen today. Nothing is impossible with God. This doesn't always mean you're going to get the exact miracle you want right when you want it. But it does remind us that God is able and God is faithful and God can and does do miracles in accordance with the purposes of his will. We see that in 2 Kings chapter 6 with Elisha the prophet and God working powerfully in his ministry, just as he works powerfully in ministries today. 2 Kings chapter 6. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, Look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let's go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place there for us to meet. We need a bigger church. <laughs> and he said, Go. Then one of them said, Won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh no, my lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. And maybe you're thinking, well, what in the world's a big deal about an axe head falling off of an axe. I mean, things happen, right? But iron was extremely expensive at this time in Israel. And iron axe head axes were hugely expensive. And it would have cost a lot of money to replace this if a replacement could be found because they were rare and expensive. The man of God, Elisha, asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there, and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. I mean, that is just a crazy miracle. Number one, it shows that God is the God of the impossible, that we can trust him and look to him, and he often does way more than all we can ask or think. Ephesians 3, verse 20. But more to my heart, this story teaches us that God cares about everyday things. Harris Faulkner was on Fox News yesterday talking about her new book, Faith Can Still Move Mountains. And in the book, she said there was a Gallup study showing that we don't believe the same things about God that we believed 50 years ago. That 50 years ago, we believed that God intervened in people's lives, and now less people believe that God intervenes in people's lives. But this story reminds us that God intervenes in people's lives, and God cares about people's lives. Even everyday mundane de details like items that we borrowed, items that we're using, items that are misplaced or lost. God cares about all the details of our lives. So pray today. Call on God today. Don't say, oh, well, he doesn't care about this stuff. I'm not going to bother him with it. He's not going to do a miracle for me. He's not going to help me. He's not going to... Don't be saying that stuff. Talk to God. He's the God of the impossible. Verse 8, now the king of Aram, that's Syria to the north, was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. It's not that the king of Israel was a super duper righteous man. Jehoram was better than his father Ahab, but he, he wasn't totally righteous either. But he had a relationship with Elisha. He did listen to Elisha from time to time. And Elisha does care about God's inheritance. He cares about the people of Israel. Verse 10, so the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? I mean, who's doing this to us? None of us, my lord, the king, said one of his officers, 
But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Well, I don't know how for sure he knew that. And I don't know how for sure Elisha knew that the king was saying all these things. Perhaps it was a supernatural revelation from God. Maybe somebody was talking to Elisha. We don't know, but Elisha was getting word and warning the king of Israel. Well, verse 13, the king of Aram says, Go, find out where he is so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. That's where Joseph was when he got captured in Genesis. He went to go find his brothers, and his brothers took hold of him there. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What? How could that be possible? That's probably what the servant is thinking. What do you mean there are more with us than more with them? They got an entire army and chariots surrounding us. You know, just hearing that there was more with them than against them was one thing, but Elisha prays that he can see it for himself. Verse 17, Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So the angels and armies of heaven were surrounding the armies of the king of Aram. And now the servant can see why Elisha was so confident, because his trust was in God, and his trust was in the protection of God. What about you? Do you trust God? Do you believe in God? Not just believe that there is a God, but do you believe in God? Do you know God? Because God is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 9.9. 9. Nahum 1.7. He cares for those who trust in him. Verse 18. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness at Elisha, as Elisha had said. That's what happened in the Sodom and Gomorrah story, that the angels struck the men of Sodom with blindness so they couldn't find the door, they couldn't take down the door and capture Lot. Verse 19, Elisha told these blind men, this is not the road and this is not the city. <laughs> Follow me and I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. Well, was Elisha being honest? I think he was being a little bit sneaky here. Verse 20, after they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Now, Elisha didn't outright lie. He's saying, I'll, I'll just show you who you're, look, who you're really looking for. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked. And there they were, inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Should I kill them, my father? That's a name for the head prophet, the, my father. Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those you captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so they can eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. The king showed grace. He showed mercy. He could have killed those raiders. But instead, he showed the raiders mercy. And they never attacked Israel again. They accepted the mercy. They were transformed by the mercy. And so they didn't do it anymore. Wow. If only that kind of diplomacy was in vogue today. If only people considered that. I know people are afraid to do that because they think the other is going to take advantage. And maybe they will. But what a tremendous... But, and this was in obedience to the word of the Lord. I mean, God said to do this through the prophet, and the king did it. But 
Look at verse 24. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. So the raiders were transformed. They never invaded again, but the king didn't take it to heart. And he raised up his whole army and he besieged Samaria. Now, what does it mean to lay siege to a country? It means to cut off access from the outside so food and goods cannot be delivered. So he was trying to starve the nation of Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head, that's gross, sold for 80 shekels of silver. Inflation! You thought the inflation was bad now. A quarter of a cab of seed pot seed pods for five shekels. So food was so inflationary. Verse 26, this is how bad it was. As the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, help me, my lord, the king. And the king replied, if the lord doesn't help you, where can I, can, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press? <laughs> There's nothing there. Then he asked her, what's the matter? She answered, this woman said to me, give up your son so we may eat him today and tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to her, give up your son so we can eat him. But she had hidden him. And she wants the king's help for this? When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. Now this reminds me of what's written in the Torah. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 52 to 53. I need to share this with you because this is, this is a prophetic statement. Deuteronomy 28, we'll start it at verse 49. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the ends of the earth, like an eagle swooping down. The eagle was the symbol of the Babylonian Empire. But also, I think, the Assyrians too. A nation whose language you will not understand. They didn't understand Assyrian or Babylonian. A fierce-looking nation without respect for the old or pity for the young. They will devour the young of your livestock and the crops of your land until you're destroyed. They'll leave you no grain, no new wine or olive oil, nor any calves of your herds. Verse 52, they will lay siege to all the cities throughout your land until the high fortified walls in which you trust fall down. They will besiege all the cities throughout the land the Lord your God is giving you. Because of the suffering your enemy will inflict on you during the siege, verse 53, you will eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of the sons and daughters the Lord your God has given you. Oh my goodness. So this is a warning of judgment on the nation if they do not obey the Lord their God. And we're seeing a partial fulfillment here with the siege of Samaria by the Arameans. And the king of Israel is angry about this. He's not angry at himself for not being a good leader. He's not angry at Israel for rejecting God. He is angry at God and at God's prophet. Look at verse 30. The king tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. He said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if the head of Elisha, son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. I'm going to kill Elisha. This is his fault. He represents God. He should be praying to God that this wouldn't happen. Obviously, he didn't. He doesn't care about the people, doesn't care about the nation. I'm going to kill him. Holy cow. So first he trusts Elisha. And now he blames Elisha. Verse 32, now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent the messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Wow, Elisha received the word from the Lord, a word of knowledge that he could know something like that. Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him. While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to him. The king said, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? Oh my goodness, so he didn't trust the Lord. He said, well, 
he, he should have said, well, this is from the Lord, so we better repent. I better shape up. But he didn't do that. Instead of turning to God, he turned away from God. He said, why should I wait for the Lord any longer? You know, when we're going through hard times, that's when we need God the most. That's when we need to turn to him, to cling to him, to hold on to him, to repent of anything we need to repent of, to get right with him. It shows a tremendous lack of emotional and spiritual maturity to blame God when times are bad. I think first we need to look inward, and then we need to look to God and his strength, and bless his holy name. Maybe you're going through a hard time today. We worship the God of the impossible. We worship a God who can make an axe head float with a stick. We worship a God who sends angels and chariots of fire to protect us wherever we go. We worship a God who's sovereign over the kingdoms of men. Put your faith and trust in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Well, we're going to be at West Haven and Brilliant today. Jeannie and I are going to lead the worship service there. I'm going to preach a Thanksgiving message. And looking, and then we got confirmation the night. We got also a deer hunter service. Also going to preach that Thanksgiving message at the church tomorrow night at 6.30. And everyone's invited to attend. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Bye-bye.